Welcome back, everyone, to another episode here on the Sit Rep Podcast. I am your host today, O Riskiny Jim, and we are back for part two of our 15 millimeter game of Mark Ritchie's Tactical Combat. So, this scenario, as we said in our title slides, is the Commonwealth assault to retake the Galabat Fortress along the border between Sudan and what is today Ethiopia. There's the fortress right there. I am commanding the Italian garrison in that fortress. My friend John is protecting my wing. And yeah, here are all the Commonwealth forces determined to take it back. So we've gone through all the elements before. There's elements of a 6th Royal Tank Regiment, a Pakistani Regiment, a Indian Regiment. It's a Commonwealth Force, 10th Indian Brigade. And they're trying to take this fortification here. So far, we've done pretty well. We've taken some pretty heavy bomb hits early in the game. And the fort, although damaged, is holding together pretty well. Here are the positions from my friend John, who really is carrying his share of the water strictly on defense. So here we see him taking yet even more fire from uh, the three Commonwealth players that are trying to take our position. The objective of the game is the fortress. So it's kind of in the south... Uh, east corner of the table there. For some reason, the Commonwealth player is attacking out of the northwest, and they're going toward that little village there that you see there to the northeast. So I'm not sure if they're trying to bypass the fort or outflank it, or if they were trying to use those buildings there as some kind of cover or try to divide our, our range of fire. There are no real ranges in this game. This is one of the things I like about this system. Uh, it is a game that gives you a uh, bonus once you get close enough. Now, to the Commonwealth player's credit, one of the things they are doing here is they are massing a lot of firepower on John's positions. So I guess maybe they're hoping to sort of deny me my support in the actual fortification before assaulting the fortification itself. So here is the wounds table. We're figuring out on a D20 like, how badly people are wounded. Those little red counters there, those little red chits, show or track the wound status of uh, individual soldiers as they've been hit. So John's doing the best he can. He's got sandbag positions and some buildings. He doesn't have an actual, you know, small castle like I do. Unfortunately for him, there are a lot of machine guns. Not a whole lot of direct high explosive firepower on the British side, thank goodness. There was one close support a 10 cruiser tank with the uh, high explosive mortar in there. I made sure I targeted him as quickly as possible as soon as I identified him. It was a bit of a challenge to identify him because I didn't know which one of those tanks. There's a lot of tanks over there. But I found finally the one that was the close support tank and targeted him. He's hull down. I had to hit him with both my howitzers, my, uh, my, my howitzer field guns, my anti-tank rifle, my uh, anti-aircraft uh, 20 mil 25 millimeter Breda gun. I had to put a lot of firepower on him just to silence that gun. I couldn't take out the tank because it's a tough tank and it is uh, hull down. But yeah, there's a lot of machine guns and um, machine guns don't do much. But when you roll, like every one of those vehicles has at least one medium machine gun. That gets to roll three times. Some of them have multiple medium machine guns per tank, per fire phase. There's a lot of D20s coming at us. The chances to hit are only like a four or something's modified down to a three or even a two. But when you get to roll, you know, D20s by the dozen, it does add up. Meanwhile, I'm taking some direct firepower there. You see those little red poof balls on the wall. Some of that is from bomb damage earlier in the game. Some of it is from uh, British howitzer fire. I'm trying to silence their one direct field gun. Um, again, that's kind of behind a, a low rise uh, over there on the other side of the table. So my fortifications are withering. Also, there are rules for crew, and I'm losing enough crewmen on some of those bigger guns, especially my 100 millimeter uh, field howitzer. And boom, a British 50 caliber Vickers just took out one of my tiny little uh, CV-33s. So yeah, it doesn't feel like the British have a lot of fire. Trust me, the British have plenty of firepower. Um, to win this game. I don't think they have as much as they started with because my spoiling cavalry charge took out their forward observers. I think that took out some of their artillery options uh, earlier in the game. 
also not 100% sure on the enemy's strategy, but we're doing the best we can. All right, then we get a little lucky with an airstrike. One of the things I was very, very careful with earlier in the game was protecting my radio. I have two radios. I think I just lost one on that uh, small piece of Italian armor. However, I've got another one, and I made sure to protect him deep within that fortress, and then I stacked some trucks around him to make sure he had cover in case any indirect fire landed in the fortress. They still haven't bombarded my fortress uh, with indirect fire. They do have a mortar on the table. They did have a field gun. Um, I did take out their forward observer, so it's not entirely their fault, but at the same time, um, anyway, by keeping that radio, I was able to start making rolls for this one Italian airstrike to come in. And um, here, no huge strategy on my part. Um, I just picked out the, the, the best target. Um, I did miss. It's almost impossible to be precise with an airstrike, given the technology of November 1940. I mean, you see it's a biplane, for crying out loud. But nevertheless, uh, I got lucky with where it drifted, and um, it did okay. So, yeah, there's not a lot of movement from my side. I'm not sure too much what I can talk about. I just set up my forces as best I could. Again, I don't command the entire Italian force. I just command what's in that actual uh, fortification there. I'm doing some shifting around. I'm shifting around some reserve crewmen. I'm trying to keep my guns up and hot because, again, those machine guns and there is a, uh, a British mortar on the table. They are taking out my crew. So, yeah, these little red poof balls show the, the status of the walls. That first big one there by the front wall, that curtain wall, was one of the initial bomb strikes. Meanwhile, my other, uh, those little turrets there are taking hits as well, and those walls are starting to crumble. My external gun pits are taking hits. Even more dangerous, notice that big um, 100 millimeter gun only has two crewmen left. It needs six to fire. So once it gets to below half, uh, I start taking all kinds of penalties on how often it can fire and how hard it hits. But my MVPs, seriously, are my 25mm anti-tank rifle and my 25mm, there it is right there, you saw it for a second, the 25mm anti-aircraft gun. Because not only do they get to shoot, um, I mean, B-class armor piercing, it's not terribly effective. But um, yeah, those slight guns and those two forward turrets there are my 25mm anti-tank rifle, rapid fire, and very rapid fire, my 25mm anti-aircraft, which is doing pretty good work on, uh, on all these British vehicles. Again, there's a lot of British armor on the table, but a lot of it's very light. Uh, Bren carriers, Universal carriers, Rolls-Royce armored cars, but the heaviest thing are those A-10 cruisers I had mentioned before, but only one of them was carrying the assault mortar. The vast majority of British tanks in this period were still carrying the Royal QF 2-pounder or 40 millimeter weapon, which I'm sure you, a lot of you guys know only carried a solid shot. So it's very good against tanks, early war tanks. Uh, when you're trying to clean infantry out of fortified positions, not so much. You need some high, high explosive. Now the way the rule worked is I didn't know which of those tanks carried the close support mortar until they fired at me. So they fired at me with a smoke screen. That actually blinded them probably more than it blinded me. Um, the good news is, once he fires, I now know which tank, I spot the shot, which tank actually um, you know, shows that. Again, there's the 25 millimeter anti-tank rifle and the 25 millimeter anti-aircraft rifle. Three shots from the rifle, five shots from the anti-aircraft gun, plus two shots from those howitzers. Sometimes it takes eight shots, but I am, wearing down the, uh, the, uh, the enemy armor quite a bit. Which is good, because John needs the support, to be honest. Alrighty, here is the situation at the end of the game. Our opponents have decided to concede the table at the end of round 7. By the way, I should note that there is no turn limit to this scenario. It's not like I have to hold on only until turn 10, or turn 12, or turn 15. It's pretty much you stand until the enemy gives up or they take your castle. And uh, they did a lot of damage. You see there my gun, has uh, its emplacement has taken some hits. I'm reduced by crew. My 25 millimeter flag gun there, also the 25 millimeter anti-tank rifle is still standing tall. That flag, right, I'm sorry, that anti-tank rifle though, does have some damage on his turret wall. So I think one more hit and that turret wall, that protective turret wall would have fallen. So yeah, a lot of near misses, a lot of almosts, a lot of woulda, shoulda, couldas. 
Here is my uh, commander, that little plus one major there. Um, I'm actually amazed he's still alive. He, he really sh almost should have died almost before the game started. A British thousand pound bomb struck right about there. You see he's standing right in front of the impact crater. It killed people to the left of him, to the right of him. I don't know what to tell you. I guess he bent over to tie his shoe at exactly the right moment and he stood back up again. He wondered where everybody went. Um, there's also my radio there. That's one of the most important units in my, in, in, in my force. I made sure he's tucked nice and snug under that wall with trucks around him, just in case the enemy drops some uh, indirect fire into my courtyard there. Because without that radio, there's no 100 millimeter off-board battery for the Italians and there's no airstrike, which is pretty important because as you can see, my direct fire forces were taking some losses. Those guns are technically still there, but their earthworks are badly damaged. They've actually fallen in some places and they are reduced in crew. And once you get reduced half crew, that gun is drastically uh, reduced in effectiveness. Over here to the right, uh, where John was commanding, um, he faced a much tougher battle, to be fair. For some reason, the enemy decided to come across there. I guess they were gonna pivot and try and attack the, 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 the fort in the flank. Uh, the fort doesn't really have any flank. Nevertheless, uh, you can see here, yeah, John's down to well below half strength. We've lost both armored cars. We've lost a couple of our CV-33s. Um, things here got uh, pretty tense. Um, it wasn't until I was able to shift fire off of the British close support tank and onboard howitzer that I was able to start chewing down the armor that carried all those machine guns that was absolutely dissecting um, you know, John's forces over there. But like I said, the enemy is not really close to our fortification. They have conceded the table. Hey, so what do you know? The Italians actually win one. Thanks very much, everybody, for watching the video. Tango Mike, as always, for all your support. This is Ariskany Gem signing off. We'll be in touch very soon.